Hey, what's going on, everybody? Welcome. It's another episode of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, and I'm joined by Brendan Wilson. Already been on the show. In fact, episode 654. You can go back and check that out. We'll probably talk about his last appearance. There's a good reason he's on again, but we'll get there in just a moment. To those of you out there, if you're new or even if you're not new, make sure you check out whistlekick.com for all the things that we're doing to connect, educate, and entertain the traditional martial arts of the world. And make sure you check out whistlekickmartialartsradio.com to go deep and get the full experience for this and every episode we've ever done. But Brendan, thanks for thanks for coming back on. Well, Jeremy, Brand thank you so much. Wilson. Yeah. <laughs> you, okay? You're, you okay if I call you Brendan? Uh, you, you can call me Brendan. That's just fine. Yeah, so. I, I appreciate um, that. Anyway, if we were, so if we were in Geezer Dobox, I, of course, would, <laughs> would default to title, but... No, no, that the title isn't as important. First of all, thank you so much for having me on again. It was a yeah. great time the first time. Um, it is an honor then, and it is an honor now um, to you. be back. I'm just so glad to be talking to you, and I'm looking forward yeah, to we had fun our conversation. Time. We did. We, we had a good time. Yeah. We had a good time. And, you know, you had reached out, and you said, you know, there, there's, there's something I want to come on, and I want to talk about. There's this... There's this subject, and and I'm going to use a word. I don't know if you used, and you and Andrew set this up more. I, I was I was involved tangentially. Uh, I'm going to use the word passion. There's a subject here that you're passionate about that you think more martial artists, whether or not they're school owners, whether or not they're high rank, should consider. Is that a fair way of? I think that's fair. Yeah. Okay. And and what is that? Why are you here? Why why are we <laughs> why are you here? here? What are we doing today? <laughs> <laughs> so. One of the things I've been doing um, in my retirement um, is I've been lecturing and writing on leadership. That doesn't and, sound like retirement. Yeah. When I, um, when, uh, I spoke with Andrew, he said, well, can you shape that to talk about how that would be applicable um, to leadership in the martial arts? So that's yeah. really what I came here to talk to you about today. I am passionate about it. Um, yeah. I don't think anything I'm going to say is going to be a surprise to anyone, but sometimes it's good to hear a focus something that people can grasp onto and perhaps use for themselves. Yeah. And, and sometimes hearing something in, in a different way from, from a different person, right? I mean, yep. you, you've probably had the same experience. Most of us have had the experience where, you know, we're working on something and yep. a different person tells us, you know, try doing this with your foot or your hand or your whatever. And yep. suddenly it clicks. And it clicks. Yeah. That's right. So where, where do we start? Where do we start in the idea of this, this fairly broad topic, right? Because leadership, I think a lot of people think of it pretty narrow. It's it's whoever whoever's in, in charge of you, right? Like for a lot of people, that's what leadership is. Yep. But of course, you know, people get entire degrees on leadership. There are, I mean, shoot, how many books have been written on leadership? You know, it's not like we've exhausted the topic. So how, how do we start to dig in? Okay, well, for me, um, I was in the Army um, as an Army officer for 25 years, and then I spent another 15 years as a diplomat working for NATO. Mm -hmm. um, and so I developed my own theory of, um, you know, what leadership is, what the role of the leader is. And um, if, if you'll allow me, I will give you an anecdote that of caused course. me to focus on that. So when I was a major in the Army, I got thrown into a position on very short notice where we had six days um, to get ready to go out from Louisiana to the Mojave Desert in California and to go through a big month-long exercise. We had to move hundreds of vehicles, mm -hmm. lots of people. I didn't know anybody um, from the unit. Um, I was only put in there because the person that was supposed to do it wasn't available and I, they just moved me into that unit early. Um, so we, got, we did that, we went out to the desert. It was really busy for me. You know, we were just doing one thing after the next, after the next. And the unit did very well, um, mostly because they had been trained well before I got there, because there was zero opportunity for me to actually say, do it this way. You know, we just had to work through the, the issues. And when I got back, the battalion command sergeant major approached me and he said, some of the officers that worked for you did very well. And he indicated that that was a reflection on my leadership. And I said, no. I said, I haven't instructed them or told them anything. A reflection is on them for how well they did. And he said, that's something I've never forgotten. The role of the leader is to create an environment where people can do their best. That's what you did, right? Mm -hmm. That's the credit that you take as a leader because you've you had good people. Again? The role of the again? leader, the role of the leader is to create an environment 
where people can do their best. And he said, that's what you did. That is the credit that I'm giving you. And that is the only credit you will ever get as a leader. <laughs> so, he didn't say that last part. But um, so for me, the question then is, how does one create an environment where people can do their best? Because the, especially the higher up you go, the less direction you can actually, you know, but we had to load hundreds of vehicles on rail. I, I wasn't there for that. You know, when somebody else supervised that and somebody else supervised the person that did that or the people that did that. So how do you actually create that? And that was kind of what I wanted to talk to you about. And then if you're willing, we could talk about how that might apply to the of martial course. arts in a martial yeah. arts environment. Yeah. Right off the bat, just that you're, you're in this anecdote, the piece I asked you to repeat gets really close to my vision of a, a really good martial arts instructor. Right? Because when, when we think about someone learning in the early days, there's a lot of hands on. There's a lot of, you know, detail. You're keeping them from falling over. Yep. But at some point, and this happens in, in every school I've ever seen, whether it's intentional or organic, eventually at higher ranks, those students are in an environment where they are moving forward. It's less, okay, now that you're a fourth degree black belt, I'm going to teach you this, that, and the other. Usually somebody gets there and it's the, the environment that's been cultivated that helps them move forward. Yep. No, and you and I agree. Instructor oversees or supports or whatever word people might throw in. Sure. Yep. Um, so uh, a couple of years ago, I got asked to give a leadership thing for um, the district conference of the um, Rotary group that I'm in. Mm -hmm. um, so I didn't really know where to start. It turned out that my neighbor two doors down at the time is Dr. Um, Keith Krasman, and he is a retired philosophy professor, and he has best-selling books on ethics, and he gets called in by corporations to give talks on ethics. So I said, oh. he's just out in his yard, you know, so I thought, hey, what do you think about this? And he said something really interesting. He's, first thing he said is the same thing you'd heard a million times, but he meant it in a different way, and that is that the leader has to have a vision and has to communicate that vision. I said, oh, yeah, you know, you have a vision statement. He said, no, 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 that's not what I mean. He said, the leader has to communicate how everyone is going to treat everyone else in the organization. He said, that's the most important thing that the, because the people won't work together well, and they have to, in order for the unit to reach their potential. So he said, how do you do that, right? So one of the ways that you do that is you present yourself as a honest and honorable person. Right, because and that's the baseline for you creating that environment. Because people will ask a certain question. They'll say, Is the boss honest? Because if the boss isn't honest, right, they are not going to be sure about a number of things that they have to be sure about in order to reach their potential. Mm -hmm. So, for example, what happens if I screw up? Right? We know from basically every leadership course in the world that a certain amount of failure is a necessary component for success. So you're gonna screw up. Everyone's going to at some point. What happens when I screw up? Is that going to be taken into account as part of me moving forward? Or am I just going to, you know, lose my job and, and be humiliated in front of everyone else? Well, they're looking to the leader to see the cue as to how that's going to, to, um, to be. What happens if I'm successful? Hmm. If I'm successful, am I going to get the credit for this? Or is somebody else going to take it? Or is somebody else going to push me to the side because they don't want me to have the spotlight? That all comes back with the, the boss being honest, I think. So to me, creating that environment, communicating that is the most important thing that the leader can do. And that's why in good organizations, they hold the leader responsible for the success or failure of the organization. Mm. Even if the leader, you know, you can't point to one thing and said well, the leader did this wrong, if the organization's failing, the boss has the responsibility because the boss could have created an environment where the organization would success be successful. Yeah, so. There's a there's a word that that I use. You're you're not using it, but I I, I would call it synonymous with environment. In this case, is culture. It's yeah. a word that a lot of people use, and and you know whether when I started my my school last year, restarted after a long hiatus. The thing that my assistant instructor and I spent the most time talking about was the culture. Because we knew if we got that right, a lot of other things would happen without a lot of effort. They would just naturally move in the direction we wanted. Yep. How do we want our students to interact with each other? How do we want them to interact 
with us? How do we want them to think of themselves on their journey? You're talking about the inevitability of failure. Yeah. I mean, yep. learning martial arts as a martial artist, no matter where you are in your journey, you're going to screw stuff up, especially if you're really pushing in the way that That's I, exactly I would right. That's exactly right. But how do they, how do they handle that? How do other people observe that when someone sees someone struggling, do they take pride in that? Because it, maybe it, it, suggest they have a higher place in the hierarchy or do they see that as everyone's role to support everyone else's progression because we stand and fall together i would imagine that you know as an outsider i look at the military and i think if i'm in there and maybe this is just because i've had great leaders i want everyone around me to be as good as i can because it helps keep me alive that's right yeah. But I've, I've just, heard yeah. enough stories from enough friends who served to know that is not always the case. Yeah. Yeah. I think you got a, you raised a good point there. So I guess the, the question for me, what I, the way I broke it down was when you come up with ethical decisions, you basically have three categories. I realize these are somewhat artificial, but the easy category is the yes, no decision, right? Mm -hmm. You've been asked to do something unethical and you just say no. And doesn't mean there won't be consequences for that. You can still get fired for refusing an order from your boss. Um, but that's a fairly easy decision um, to make. Um, the example I gave in the paper that I recently um, written and in when, I, when I speak is when I was a, a lieutenant in the 101st Airborne Division, we were shooting live fire in support of troops in an exercise. Um, and my battery commander, so the person senior to me, but he wasn't experienced in this type of artillery, and said, oh, I need you to, we're going to shoot the guns right up next to the troops for some sort of um, realistic training. Um, you can do that, but there's some safety regulations that need to be followed. And he, and, uh, and he said, and we're not going to have an observer. So that's the primary, anybody's in artillery will get this. If you don't have an observer, you can't fire safely. Because if the round doesn't go where it's supposed to go, the observer is the one that tells everybody to stop. But if you're on the guns and there's no one to tell you to stop, and you shot in the wrong place, you just continue to shoot mm -hmm. um, according to the schedule. So I told him, um, we've got to have an observer. And he said, no, we don't have time for an observer. Um, I want you to shoot without I said, I will not do it. we got to have an observer. And I even said, all, all it takes is for somebody to go up to the hill, the, the observation post, and call in the mission. My driver can do it. He can go up there right now. We can be ready in 20 minutes. He said, no, we don't have time. I want you to shoot now. And I said, I'm not going to. <laughs> so mm -hmm. he said, I'm going to bypass you and have the fire direction center send the data down to the guns to shoot it. I said, no, you won't. I am in command of the guns and you can relieve me and do as you please, but you cannot send that data down to the guns. I will put the guns in a, what's called check fire status, which we they can't fire by law. Um, and we, we need to get this solved. So then his boss comes in, right? So I'm a lieutenant, right? He's a captain. Lieutenant Colonel comes in really, really frustrated. And he says, everybody's waiting on you guys. I got a general officer out there waiting to see this, right? What's the holdup? And he says, Lieutenant Wilson's refusing the order. So by that time, I got the, the book out, right? And the book is law. It really is. So, I mean, if, if you want to do this, if I shoot this mission and somebody gets injured or killed, I'm liable morally and I'm liable legally. I can go to jail for that. Mm. Um, anyway, so, he, so before he could say something angry, a helicopter lands and his boss gets out which is the division artillery commander. And he comes over and he goes, hey, you know, what's up, man? Everybody's waiting on this, right? And he says, Lieutenant Wilson's not, not willing to do it. So he says, tell me about it. So he was calm and everything. So I showed him the book. I explained it to him. And he goes, and he turns to the battalion commander, whose name was Russell. And he says, Russ, send somebody up to the hill. Let's get this done. So we did it exactly the way I, I said we should do it. And the reason I raised that is because that's an easy decision. Mm -hmm. See, I couldn't have obeyed that order, period. And I would never have been excused for obeying the order, right? Knowing that it was wrong, and then somebody got injured or killed. My responsibility is to is to protect the lives of the infantry that's that's out there. Easy decision, yes, no. We can take most of those decisions without leaving the house, right? And that's what I would say is the very first level of ethical. It's not even a dilemma. Um, you just right. can't do the things that are wrong. Yeah. yeah, and and I have to ask your 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 commanding officer. Was there any consequence for him? Okay, so interestingly enough, my battery commander wrote on my efficiency report that I was not a yes man. He meant it as a sort of a sideways 
compliment criticism. Uh, it's an unusual comment for um, maybe it wasn't 40 years ago, but it, it is fairly unusual. And the battalion commander wrote that I was the best lieutenant in the battalion. So he recognized the fact that I had probably saved them some trouble, mm-hmm. um, even though I had embarrassed them in front of his own boss. But, you know, they should have they should have sent an observer up and they shouldn't have asked me to do something that yeah. I know to learn the lesson. Yeah. And to recognize the, the reality. Yeah. And, you know, to me, uh, you know, the two things in the military, martial arts too, mission accomplishment and safety. Those are the two things that you make sure that you stick with. And if you're setting the example as a leader, everybody watches. Mm-hmm. Right. Do the soldiers know that Lieutenant Wilson isn't going to do something wrong? Yep, they know it because he just about got his, you know, tush kicked mm-hmm. um, by refusing to do something. And they, in the same way, should also... Because, you know, at the at the section level, every sergeant has safety responsibilities um, and those are not delegable. You mm-hmm. got to do it. You know, you're the boss. You're the one that says, no, we're not going to do it, even if it makes us late, even if it makes us look bad. So. All right. What's the second? OK, so the Adam. second level is the one that's more common. That's the one that we all face. And that's where we have conflicting mm. levels of um, ethical responsibilities, where the decision that you have to take is going to push one or the other, and there's no clear um, decision that is obviously right. Mm. Every decision has negative consequences for you and for others. And the example that I like, my, doc, my daughter is a doctor. When she was a resident, she was supposed to do like an overnight thing in oncology, which she was allowed to sleep. She just had to be there. But when she got to the hospital, they said, oh, no, no, we're short a doctor. You have to be in charge of the emergency reaction team for the whole hospital. So she's doing it. She's a, she's a doctor. As a resident. As a second year resident. Yeah. Wow. Okay. And so she's got a five person team. They're going whenever, you know, somebody crashes or, or whatever. And then one of her patients was starting to fade. And so she calls up to, um, the, um, um, sorry, my <laughs> okay. intensive care sure. and says, I need to put this patient in intensive care. And the resident up there tells her the attending, the supervising doctor, will not take this patient unless you do the following tests. And she says, I don't have time. Some of these tests are going to take hours. I'm coming up. So she comes up, and with the nurses and the other residents around, she confronts the doctor. She puts her finger in his chest and says, this patient is going to die. Make up your mind. He said, I'll take it. And, you know, as a, as a resident, you can ruin your, your life by doing that. Mm. And uh, so he, um, later in the week, asked her out for coffee, and he said, we'd like to offer you um, a fellowship um, in intensive care. Um, we like the way you do business, right? Mm. So he didn't hold it against her. And when she graduated, she got the chairman's award. Now, here's why that's harder, right? As a doctor under supervision and in training, right, she is really only obliged to follow whatever order she's given as long as she's not violating any method of medical ethics, which she was, would not have been had she said, I'll give the test. I was told to do that. The patient might have gotten worse. The patient might have died. And so what she had to do was to weigh those things, right, and then decide which one she was going to take forward and knowing that there would be consequences no matter what she did, right? Yeah. So that's... That's the harder decision. And of course, that's the one we all face. I mean, you it can't is. raise a family. You can't run a martial art yeah. business, nothing without having to say, I'm weighing these different things. How am I going to go forward? It, it's constant. I mean, we're bombarded every day. Do I do A or B? And there's no clear yep. decision or even worse, A, B, C, D, Q. Yep. And you can only pick two of them, right? And so that right. a, a lot of people get paralyzed under that. Yep. decision process because and, there's no clear objective determinant. I agree. And one of the things I think that made this clear was the pandemic. We mm. had people raising families who had to decide whether I'm going to keep my family completely safe or am I going to make a living and have enough to eat? Am I going to send my child to school where they might be exposed and then I might be exposed? Or are we going to, you know, you, those are difficult decisions and there isn't a best answer. There was only the answer the choice that you pick and the consequences that come from that. Um, we would never say you did the wrong thing, mom. We would have to say, mom, you made the decision that you had to make as a mother um, to, to do that. So to me, I think that reflects that kind of thing. Cause of course, every parent, every mother 
you know, is a leader, let's face it, in a very, very sure. important leadership role. Um, they've got the lies of their family that they have to um, uphold. And they're, and they're responsible for creating that environment for, yeah. for progress, for growth, got for it. being raised, or whatever, whatever. Got it. Thrown there. So I promise at some point I'm going to get to um, how this affects the martial arts, but I... I, I, I'm already hearing it, and I suspect the audience is yeah, too. Good. Right, we're, we're setting out a framework that they can good. They can understand. Okay, so is that at the end of two? Are we, are we on to the third one? We're on the third. Yeah. Okay. So to me, the third one has to do with once the decision is taken and the consequences become known, how do you deal with that? Um, so my my the example that I like to give is Viktor Frankl, who who wrote uh, Man's Search for Meaning. He was uh, a physician. Um, he and his pregnant wife were incarcerated um, at the beginning of World War II um, in a concentration camp. He was separated from his wife. She was almost immediately murdered. He did not know that until the end of the war, five years later. Um, and he said an interesting thing. When he wrote Man's Search for Meaning, he said, the best of us didn't come back. He said, we had to do really, really hard things to survive. And everybody knew it. Nobody was pretending it was otherwise. Right. So that admission to me and then he moves on and he said, but the most important thing we can do with our lives once those decisions have been taken. Right. Is to make a success out of a tragedy, because that's what your life is now. Right. You have a tragedy. What are you going to do about it? And he decided he would just tell people what had happened when he wrote this book. It's hard to read, but it's a good read. And then he went on to practice medicine. He was a um, a psychiatrist, he wrote books, he helped people, um, and he could have done something else. He could have just gone back to the house and said, man, I really feel bad, and other people made me do these things, you know. Um, I was just responding, they're the terrible people, right, and I'm going to spend the rest of my life blaming somebody else. He didn't mm. do that. He acknowledged what happened, and he acknowledged his role that he played in that, and he went on to do really wonderful things and help other people's lives. So to me, the hard decision is what you do once those consequences have been taken. <clears throat> and I'm a little bit ahead of myself, but it's one of the reasons why I write novels. And so <laughs> when you get to that point, I'll tell you how that, how that works. But anyway, thank you for your patience so far. So sure, I appreciate sure. it. This is good stuff. All right. So I, I think, I think as we, we, look through that trichotomy of, of how we look at stuff. I think most of the decisions that we would face day to day in our personal lives, it's pretty clear where, where they roll in. But what about as, as a martial arts school? Because there are, you know, going back to your, your military experience, the, the mission is generally pretty clear it's set out by somebody above you but the mission of the martial arts school yep. is it is it keeping people safe is that the, the most important thing is it making sure that you make enough money that the school survives so you can continue to help people and maybe it's your job as well so you're you're yep. staying alive and taking care of your family is it making sure that your students are able to defend themselves out on the street is it that they are advancing in rank there there are i would see a multitude of missions that most of the time move in the same direction, but sometimes there are certain circumstances pop up and they're in conflict. Yep. I, I, you just stole, stole my next part of my, yes. <laughs> but I, I would prefer think... to say unconsciously set you up. There we go. For the, your um, no, no. I think the burden for an independent martial arts uh, instructor who runs their own studio is in some ways higher than it would be for a military officer. I mean, if you just look at what the responsibilities are, the, as you said, if you are running your own school, there really isn't anybody over you to say, here's the book you have to follow. You might be part of an organization and you might have rules that you have to follow for, for business, but you're the one that's gonna set the tone um, right. for everyone. And those things like, what's the level of discipline that we're going to have in this, this mm -hmm. class, right? Um, how are we gonna handle promotions? Are they going to be fair? Um, are they going to be difficult so that when my student leaves here as a green belt, blue belt, whatever, that they can hold their head up when they go to another school or they go to a tournament or something? Um, and then 
you raise the issue of financial responsibility, right? You're a financial custodian. You have to deal with money that your students are going to give you, their parents are going to give you, and you have to handle that money um, in a way that's um, both responsible and you have to be seen to be doing that in a responsible way. So I would say all of the things that I talked about before um, are important for leadership. And then the other thing that happens is in the Army, we have a procedure for doing everything, right? I, I knew exactly how to fire the guns because it's in a book and there's a right way and that's it. There isn't any other way. There's just the right way. But there's not necessarily one way of how you build that environment. Like mm -hmm. I said, set the conditions for success as a martial artist. Um, so, you know, for example, I'll give you some of the things that I used to do. I would always sit down with every new student, every new student, and I would talk them through what their requirements were for classes, how they were supposed to behave, right? And I would, of course, big, I'm big on safety, as you haven't figured that out yet. And I would say, here's how we do for safety. If you're not comfortable with what you're doing, you just raise your hand. And we'll stop until you are comfortable, right? We're not going to do something that's going to risk you. If you're injured, I want to see that hand come up. I don't want you to continue if something's um, injured. But I do need to do, you to show respect for the other students because their mm -hmm. safety. And then I would have them sign it. And if they were a minor, I'd have their parents sign it, right? Not because I was so worried about being sued, but because I wanted to impress upon them this is a serious organization. We're not just coming to the gym and playing basketball with the pickup team. Nothing wrong with that, but that's not what we're doing. Right. We're doing we're doing something else. Um, as far as like promotions, now we want to have high standards, but we don't want to bring people into a situation where they're going to be humiliated in front of their family members or other students. What I used to do is before any exam, I would put the students through a pretest, which was harder than the exam. Um, much harder, especially at really? the higher levels. Pardon? Okay. Right. Yeah, really? okay. yeah, at the higher levels, it was, you know, if you were going up for a red belt or a black belt, you were going to do that. And for a black belt, they would probably not pass the pretest the first two or three times, mm. right? But it's a pretest. It's not a real test, right? They're not failing. They're just trying to meet the standards. And in each case, I would be very direct with what they needed to do better on, to improve. And then when we get to the point where they pass the pretest, Right. Then we we'll be going for the test. And by that time, it's opening night. They know what's coming. Right. There's not going to be anybody that's going to fail because they really have already met all the standards under very grueling circumstances. And then when we would do the test, occasionally somebody would really have a bad day. And rather than failing them, they had a long day. <laughs> so. I would put another student up there with them. If they were doing forms, we'd go through their forms and then they'd make them do it. I had a green belt one time, wonderful young woman, 45 minutes just by herself mm. um, over and over. And she was furious by the time she finished, but she passed. <laughs> so, um, and she was really doing it right because she was mm. so angry um, at having to do it over and over and over again. That was my approach. I'm not saying that's the best approach, but that worked for me. I've taught for almost 43 years now. I've never failed a student, right? Because there was no reason to, and I assure you that I am confident that my standards are as high as other people. Mm -hmm. um, so that was one way of kind of dealing with this idea of what's the environment that they're coming into, right? Are you allowed to fail? Absolutely. Am I going to let you fail in front of your parents? No. You're going to have your act together when your parents come in here to see that test. Right. Um, and then for, and for safety, you mentioned safety. Is your primary responsibility safety? It is, but if you want to be perfectly safe, close the studio down, right? Um, and I haven't had that many injuries, but I had some. You know, I've had the, the, the occasional broken finger. I had somebody get an ACL tear once. Mm. Um, the occasional bloody nose. Um, <laughs> so I'll just tell you a story. I used to teach Hungarian students when I was in Belgium. They were okay. part of military families. And one of my... Uh, uh, one of my students, he was about 12, and he got injured. He was rolling around on the floor, you know, hurt. So I called his mother to come get him, and she came, and she looked at him. She said, I don't see any bone. Get back in there. So that was her view. <laughs> that is that is some old school attitude. Right? Yeah, they're, they're, the Hungarians are tough people. They really are. Yeah. Um, anyway, so, yeah, that's, safety is always going to be a balancing test from what you would like to accomplish and how things should be how things should be done um, in a safe environment. The students need to be supervised. You know, if they're sparring, there needs to be somebody there mm -hmm. controlling that sparring. They shouldn't be off on in a place where you can't see them and have them sparred because you're asking for trouble. At least my view. 
I would agree. Yeah. Okay. How do we how do we balance those things? Okay. And how do how do we make sure that assistant leadership, right? Because because leadership in most martial arts schools, even if there aren't uh, paid positions, yep. most of us in the front of the room have people that we lean on. Yep. How do we make sure that they're holding to our priorities and helping create that environment where people can flourish? Yep. Um, it's a difficult situation. I most of my teaching came out of the um, uh, the World Taekwondo Federation style. Um, assistant instructor had to be a third degree black belt. Um, so by the time you get an assistant instructor that's a third degree black belt, you've got somebody that um, shares your views and is competent. Um, so I might have like um, a higher student show another student one step sparring or something, but I wouldn't let um, a red belt supervise two students um, sparring. Mm -hmm. Right? If we're going to do things that are a little bit more dangerous, you know, joint locks, takedowns, sparring, breaking boards, that's going to be supervised, in my view, by somebody that is fully qualified and shares my view of how that should be done. Knowing that sometimes people get hurt. You know, I had a, I had a young woman one time um, do a jump sidekick like you did with Chung Mu, uh, and she broke three boards. She was about 15 at the time. And the, for the one millionth time, almost always the boards just go flying. For some reason, the boards just collapsed on her foot, right? And when she came down on the other supporting leg, it tore her ACL. A freak accident, done it a thousand times. I've never seen that again before or since. And she was out for months, you know? Um, that's an unavoidable accident. It was correctly supervised. Sometimes things just go wrong. Um, so I wouldn't um, say that. But I do have, um, you know, I had started my own martial arts called Aristos, right? Where we had taken the hard style um, techniques from Tang Soo Do and Taekwondo and applied the principles of classical Greece. Mm -hmm. And to me, that provides some guidance for shaping where the students will go when you talk about it and to try to take that forward in that environment where they can grow. Okay. All right. My wheels are turning. If, if you, I know my role in this moment, I'm, I'm supposed to, to, to take what you've said and, and move the conversation forward. And I don't know if I can because the wheels <laughs> are turning so hard. So I think I'm going to ask you, maybe I just did it. I think I'm going to ask you, where do we go next? Okay. What, what I would like to talk about, if you'll permit me, is Please. the principles that we applied from classical Greece to these hard yeah. style Asian martial arts. So the yeah. first one is arate. Arate is the idea of excellence, right? So in its most basic form, um, Aristotle had this idea is you are what you do, right? If you want to be a musician, if you want to learn to play the flute, right? You play the flute until you're a master of the flute, but you really have changed yourself. You're not just somebody who plays, picks up the flute and plays it. You're, that musical ability, that ability to create and transmit that to others is now part of who you are. You are a different person because you did to learn, you learned to play the flute as a musician. We try to uh, um, do that in the martial arts, arate, mm -hmm. and because they can feel it. You know, if they've been there for six months, they're starting to be able to do things they never thought they could do. You know, just the sidekick, which took me a lot longer than six months, um, is part of that transition. And what I wanted to communicate to my students was the martial arts isn't the whole world, right? Your life is the whole world, mm -hmm. right? When you go out to become um, a chef, you know, a computer expert, a doctor, a lawyer, a biologist, a police officer, a military, you are going to change yourself because you will submit yourself to the discipline of learning something new, right? And that arate should stay with you as you go forward. For most of my students who were either in high school or college, um, that's their studies. You know, they're learning something hard um, and, and difficult and it's changing them and it's important that they do it to their best of their abilities. So I would sometimes get some good feedback from parents who were saying, you know, Johnny is being much more diligent about his homework now. <laughs> and I, and they said, what would you, what did you do to him? I said, I've never talked to your son about homework ever. We talk about arate excellence. They're the mm -hmm. ones that are deciding to do their homework. Um, and if it, and if the exposure to the martial arts is helping them do that, then, then we're happy to create that level of environment. That's arate. That's the first one. So. What's the next one? Next one is agon. 
So agon means struggle. We use it for the English word agony. Um, and it was this idea, it was just this idea that there's a time to do the hard thing. You know, it's not necessarily sparring. It might just be your blue belt. And as you know, a hard style a blue belt is like the hardest level because up to then you're just learning things and you're getting all kinds of good feedback. And then you get to be a blue belt and all of a sudden the instructor is wants you to do things correctly. <laughs> <laughs> I was a blue belt for 18 months going almost every day. Um, and I needed it. And that was a hard, hard time for me. I think a lot of people quit when they're blue belts. Right. Yeah. And we wanted to get to them. There's a time to continue. We would call it perseverance. Mm -hmm. You know, you're exhausted. You're getting lots of negative feedback. Other people are passing you by. But you, there's a time to do the hard thing. And that also applies to other aspects of your life, mm -hmm. which it must. You know, no lawyer, no doctor, no accountant, no engineer has ever just sailed through you know, get with lots of praise and success. They always have to sit down and say, OK, I'm not doing this. I need to do something different. What is it that I need to do better? Mm. And, and I think that this, this, whether it's, it's your, the folks in the audience think of it as, as agon or doing the hard things or, you know, the, the, what came to mind to me, I came out of class last night, horse dance, right? Like, yep. why do we do horse dance? Well, we, we can come up with a lot of reasons, but kind of embracing that difficulty because most of the world has gotten really good at removing difficulty. And so it's, it's a muscle, the ability to persist through difficulty. I think that discipline is the most important thing yep. that comes out of martial arts. It is the reason I'm able to do the things that I do. And it's something that so few people have the opportunity to develop these days. Yep. No, I, I agree with that. Yep. The, the next level that has to do with behavior um, so I'll give you a little story. When, when I went to test for my fifth degree black belt, I did it out in Las Vegas and the Kukiwan sent instructors down. And I was a little bit disappointed because it was very, you know, I'm the instructor and you're not. Um, and there didn't seem to be any mutuality. You know, it was very rigid instructor. And I, I was in a place for that, but that's not what I wanted to do. That's what actually mm -hmm. got me to take a sabbatical from teaching and develop um, Aristos was I wanted to have something different. And what we, um, what we focused on, what we settled on is Zania. Zania is the Greek um, phrase, which means the guest host relationship, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, it was originally designed or at least explained when somebody comes to your door and they're look, seeking shelter. Back, back in classical Greece, there were no hotels. Um, you were supposed to treat them as if they were a god and they would show you the respect that's due to you as the owner of the house. So you have this mutually exchanged um, obligations for safety, um, for um, courtesy, uh, and the instructor is the instructor. You got to do what the instructor says when you come in the thing. But the student is also something, someone that should be respected always, even the very first student. They shouldn't be yelled at for doing something that is normal for them. You know what I'm saying? They should be encouraged. The standards can be set high without ever disparaging anyone's effort. So we wanted to get that guest host relationship, which comes out naturally, if, you know, the bowing, which is correct, the, the deference to a senior student, the senior student takes over. If there's nobody else there, the senior student should show the most restraint. Um, the, the junior student, student should listen. Um, I think that's a, a normal type of thing. And then the last two are basically technical things. We had techne, which is the actual mechanism for delivering power, focus, balance, agility. It's what I saw you doing on YouTube when you were doing uh, Chung Mu, um, that mechanism of easy, smooth, rapid motion, accelerating to the point of impact, and then you stop it because you don't need to go any further. Either the punch or the block or the kick is gone where it's gone, and then you're ready to move on to the next thing. So we work on that um, uh, to try to get the students to relax, to be able to focus power correctly, and also to be able to control themselves. And then the, the final one is uh, RK. So arche is the Greek word for foundation. It's where we get the English word archaeology. Mm. And that's basically we have, we, we developed one long, it's actually, I didn't develop it, but I adopted it from something I, I learned. It's a one long form that has most of the very basic techniques included in it. And the students do it beginning and end of every class. They get used to it. And the reason that that's helpful to me as an instructor is because 
if we can get RK down with the correct amount of technique down, the students can advance even if they're not 18 years old. Mm. You know, if I've got a 60 year old student um, or a student that's heavier or a student that has, a, for all practical purposes, a limitation on their mobility because of an injury or for weight or for whatever reason, we can still develop them and they can still advance without having to do every single technique <laughs> that an 18 year old do that. 360 degree turn, which I saw you do, right? That gets to be a little bit harder when you're 60, trust me. And it's not really necessary because um, you, we have younger people do that motion because they can, because it challenges them and makes, forces them to agility. But it's not really a martial arts technique. Um, you're never going to do that 360 degree turn. <laughs> I really hope not. <laughs> and so if I have an older student, I'm, I'm going to cut out anything that's going to be dangerous or mm. superfluous to them. I want them to do techne and RK the best that they can do and all of the forms, um, the pumse, whatever you want to call them, they can always be adapted for the aptitude of the student within the standards set by those two um, conditions. And again, that's part of what I think we talked about before, which is setting the environment for people to be successful. If you're 60 years old, you want to come work out, you don't want to be told, well, in order to get your red belt, you've got to jump over you know, three people and break three boards with a sidekick, that they're just going to quit. They're not going to come in, right? And it's not necessary for them to do that. They can still meet the standards without doing all of the fancy stuff. The young people, when they can do it, yeah, we're going to make them do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I, I see a difference between standards and challenging, right? You're, you're, you're kind of talking about breaking those two out. And I think that that's really important. You know, people have to know certain things, but then we get this opportunity to individualize a bit and make sure that everyone feels challenged with where they are. That's kind of the interesting things about it. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, that's a, a good martial point. arts class, right? It's a, it's a good point. It's an individual pursuit, but done in a group. Yeah. And that's another layer of complexity for those of us. No, I, I like that. World. I really like that. And then the final thing in leadership that I would say in the martial arts is what's the role of the very prominent martial mm. artists, right? We're talking, you know, Cynthia Rothrock, Bill Superfoot Wallace. How do you present yourself so that thousands, tens of thousands of people are going to be impacted by your behavior, by, by your deportment. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's really important. Uh, those are two of my heroes. So um, we talked a little bit about this before we went on. Um, we um, Cynthia Rothrock, of course, you know, superhero from the time I was, you know, struggling through um, be, be learning a down block. Um, Hall of Famer back in the 80s, which is amazing. And she still makes movies. And she's a very modest and polite and um, just a good person. And we went out, I, I met her out when I was out in um, uh, Atlantic City at this um, martial arts conference. And, you know, we went through, my wife and I went through her seminar. It's good. She's good people. You know, she's setting a good example for everyone else, mm -hmm. including women who would like to make their way in the martial arts. And then, you know, you're a member of, of Bill's um Superfoot Wallace's organization, as am I, and he is amazing. And my wife and I kind of um, jumped on him. You know, he came off the stage. We wanted to talk to him, so we jumped on him. We said, "Hey, hey, hey!" You know, and Kay had gone through one of his seminars years before, and just a great guy. You know, a very helpful guy. And you know, and as I told you before, they both wrote something nice about my new book. Um, so, but they were my heroes, even if they hadn't done that. And so, I think that's one step level. When you get to be a certain age, you set the tone for a wider audience of people to reaffirm the positive aspects of the martial arts so that people can take that and it would reinforce what they would like to get out of the martial arts. Mm. You wrote a new book. I did. Because you I wrote did. another book. Yes, I did. So right? it's around the time that you were on before, because I'm pretty sure yeah. it's on my bookshelf. Yeah, that's Battle, true. Battle and I know you've Achilles? read it, so I don't have to worry about it. Okay, this is, is the first book. The Achilles Battle Fleet. Achilles. Okay. Hey, I got I got two of the words of the title out of my brain. I'm there really proud of myself. Yeah. And it's it basically take is 500 years from the date of the attack on Pearl Harbor. There's another attack, but it's a galaxy wide attack. Okay. And Mei Ling Lee is a junior officer in a backwater assignment with a backwater boss. And because of all the casualties and the wartime environment, she has to step up and do things that she has been trained for, but are hard, hard to do. She has to exert her leadership and she has a number of adventures. So it's an adventure book. But um, the second book takes it forward from there. 
This is Warrior Goddess, book two. Um, it takes Mei Ling forward um, from that. Um, and again, you know, it's an adventurous thing. She fights monsters, pirates, non-human species, time travel, all the wonderful things you'd like to get in a, in a, uh, in a sci-fi book. But what I was after, my core after is, what happens when you make, have to make difficult decisions? Yeah. Um, in this case, she's making difficult wartime decisions, you know, and it's life or death. Somebody lie, dies and somebody lives. And how do I weigh the mission against mm -hmm. the safety of the personnel involved? And what point do I do something that I wouldn't otherwise do because the stakes are high? And that happens to her in the first book, and she is called to account for it. Um, and then the Navy wants her tried. They want to put her, they want her to go to jail and maybe even to the death penalty for what she's done. And she's okay with that, right? Um, she'll fight that. But what she has to ask herself is what kind of person am I really, right? Mm. Am I sorry for the things I've done? No, <laughs> I'm not sorry. Does that make me a bad person? Let me think about that. Um, how am I going to go forward now that I've done something which I would never have dreamed I would have done, but the circumstances were such that that's what I did. Kind of like Viktor Frankl in the, in the prison camps. So that's kind of what I was after as far as from a literary perspective, is I wanted to put people into very difficult decisions and see how they get out of them. And I don't know, I don't have a plot like that. You know, I, the, the vehicle is damaged, the missile is inbound, they're trying to get to jump status, and they can't. You tell me. I don't know how they're going to get out of it, but by the time I write it, they've gotten out of it somehow. Right. Or, or they haven't. <laughs> You'll have to read the book. So. I have to read the book. Um, you're setting out these books to teach, I mean, I, I imagine to entertain, but also to, to kind of educate, to get people to think. It's not simply fiction to you that's kind of i'm reading between the lines here am i right no i think you're right in fact um okay. bill wallace uh, very kindly wrote um and we used it on the back of the book he said you'll come for the adventure and you'll leave with something to think about mm. um so for me you can be read it at any level you know if you just want the adventure that's fine there's nothing in there that's going to you know keep you from doing that um but part of it was what i wanted to do you know what i'm saying i'm getting this out too because you know, I have those things in my past where we had to make difficult decisions. Um, and um, how do I think about myself, too? So you're sort of, you're sort of, it's a little bit of a cathartic experience to write those things out. And I know you've written books, too, and I'm yeah. sure you've done the same, you know. It, it, it's such a, um, it can be uh, an exhausting way to teach lessons to a lot of people, right? But how else do you do it? Right? Writing a book is really, really hard work, but I know that, that your books have sold quite a few copies, and, and as much as we have quite a bit of reach here at the show, you've sold more books than people are going to watch this episode. And you can go in more in depth, and you can create uh, not quite real scenarios, so it allows them to suspend some of what might bog them down as they work through the initial front of, of ethical dilemma. Yeah. And it, it's, I don't know, books, especially fiction. There's, there's a reason that the oldest forms of, of chronicling information or storytelling, right? That yep. It's something yep. hardwired for all hardwired. of us. Yep. And that's why I, I love when people take the format of fiction and they do something with it. They don't just, I'm going to throw entertaining words on a page that there's, there's a lesson yeah. in there. No, that's right. And, you know, one of the things I did um, is I modeled some of the characters on some of the characteristics of people that I had met, mm. that I admired, and a few people that I didn't admire, but I won't tell you who those are. But one of the, one of the main characters is Admiral Jay Chambers, right? He's, her, he's Mei Ling's boss. In the second novel, he disappears um, after a bit battle. Um, he's believed to have gone rogue. He's believed to have started a criminal empire using his special operations um, skills and so forth. And she has to go undercover to try to find him and try to decide what he's doing, either arrest him or whatever, right? So that's kind of the thing in there. So Jay Chambers is actually the name of one of my high school, um, uh, actually before high school friends. He, oh, he oh. has since passed. He was a colonel oh, in the sorry. army. We went to, um, when I was in high school, my parents died while I was still in high school. 
and his parents took me in. They're wonderful people. They have since passed. Um, he, um, he passed in 2009, and I reached out to his widow, and I said, can I use his name for this character? Mm -hmm. She said, yeah, we're happy to have you do that. But he, and of course, nobody can really do justice to a real hero, right? Jay was a real hero. Um, this is a fictional person, so it's not really doing justice to it. But some of those, as a military officer, some of those key characteristics that senior leaders do, um, I think were important to bring out. You know, first of all, say what you mean and nothing else, right? If you're a senior leader, you're not in the role of explaining things, every decision. You tell people to do it and you expect them to do it, right? You take care of your people, but you hold them to the standards. Um, so it was a mix of things, you know, um, because it wasn't just what I knew about Jay. I mixed other people's characteristics in there. But I did do that for some of the characters actually named for people that I know who have high standards, um, who I think are, are high ethical standards. And I put them in a difficult situation. So, so far, nobody's complained. But <laughs> and um, anyway, how do people find your books? Um, so Where? you can go to Amazon.com. Um, both books are there. Um, uh, my name's Brendan Wilson. So you can find it under Brendan Wilson. Um, you can also go to my website. It's called brendanwilsonwrites.com. The books are for sale there. If you if you want to buy a book through that source, I will send an inscribed signed copy oh, cool. um, out. And uh, that's been kind of fun, you know. So I'm meeting yeah. people that way. Yeah. Um, but I'm happy to, for them to do it, however they would like to do it. Those are the two. The two ways of getting the book. Yep. Oh, great. And uh, are there any other links or anything people should have? Social media is that a big thing for you? You know, Brendan Wilson. I'm on Facebook. You can okay. find me there. Um, if you, I actually have two Facebook accounts. One is for the the book, and the other one's mm -hmm. kind of my personal one. Either one's fine. Um, both um, uh, Bill Wallace and Cynthia Rothrock created advertisements. You know, pushing the, the book, which I was very oh, happy. Nice. So if you want to see what they had to say about it, um, there you, you can see that on Facebook or, or on my um, or on my website. Oh, that's great. That's great. And of course, audience, if you want to go deeper into Brendan's martial arts training, we talked about that in a typical interview episode back on episode 654. So you can find that anywhere that you would find any of our other content. In fact, wherever you found this, you can you can got it. That. Um, but yeah, th thanks for being here and. You can probably see it in my face in the audience if you're watching this rather than listening. You can see this in my face. There, there, are, there are wheels turning, and it's not every episode that makes the wheels turn for me. And I, I love that when it happens in episodes. So thanks for Good. thanks for breaking my brain a little bit. Good. Well, I'm working on the third book. Okay. Is this a trilogy, or are you going to keep going? It's a trilogy. Going? Yeah. Okay. It's a trilogy, but all trilogies can be extended. So let's see how the third book does. Right. But this in the second book, I'm I've left quite a cliffhanger at the end. Um, some people really liked it. Um, my brother, who is a scholar of English literature, said he was disturbed by it. So, <laughs> so okay, I don't know that, if that's a compliment that is, or not. But I think it is that to to create emotion, right? And I'm thinking about cliffhangers from from two part sitcoms when I was a kid. Right, that was a big thing in that format. And, okay. and I remember certain ones yelling at the TV. Well, come on, you can't. Or, or you start you start watching towards the end. You know, there's seven minutes left in the show, and you're going, "There's no way they're wrapping all this up." And you start to get emotional, and I think that that's quite a compliment because it means you've created such a connection that people are upset that they have to wait to find out what's happening with these people who do not exist. That's right; they don't exist. Yeah, they don't. But we exist, and there there is some truth to all of that, isn't there? Um, it wouldn't be interesting if we don't if we didn't reach in and touch something that people find important in their own life. It can't be completely imaginary. It has to be. What do I think about my integrity? What do I think about safety? What do I think about being successful? What do I think about my my um, enemies? You know, how how do I going to deal with them? Um, how am I going to deal with people that I don't like? Um, that's all in the book. Well, thanks for being here. Thanks for coming back. And we'll have to have you back for book three. It's a great honor to be here. I really enjoyed it. And I am very grateful, eternally grateful for you reaching out and giving me this opportunity. Thank you. Thanks for spending the time.